Welcome back to Rockstock Channel. It is Wednesday at 10 p.m. Uh, we're here with Reg Spencer of Canaccord. I think for the third or maybe fourth time, uh, Reg, I was looking back at my notes and I saw we did a video with you in September of 2021, you know, called Lithium Plaid Acceleration. The market was in a bit of a, um, a boom time then, but the first time we spoke with you was I think in July of 2019. Uh, which was not a good time <laughs> uh, in, in the market. And uh, I remember seeing you or meeting you for the first time. It might've been 2016 or 2017. You're in New York. Uh, Canaccord had a, um, an event where Volkswagen, uh, there was a speaker, Volkswagen had all these great ambitions, which they still do, but uh, have been you know, a bit of a disappointment on the Volkswagen side, just uh, going back in history. But bottom line is that we've been through a lot of cycles uh, together with you. Reg, uh, you have put out a new note called uh, Lithium First Half 24 Recharge, which is of similar title to the one you had in 2020, which was also called Recharge. Uh, you're you're, you're going to tell us that you're not expecting us to go back to, you know, $80,000 um, again, but okay, you aren't predicting that in 2020 either. Uh, but, uh, we want to go through that note. I just want to, before we begin, just to remind everybody, if you like this video, please like, and subscribe to Rockstock channel. And if you want to get our lithium bull, we just published one called lucky lithium for February to, uh, celebrate St. Patrick's day and, uh, you know, celebrate the, the green that's on the RK equity scoreboard and in rising, you know, futures and spot prices. Uh, but please go to our website, rkequity.com. And you can uh, register your email to get that directly in your email box. And please uh, follow Rodney and me on X. My handle's at Lithium Ion Bull, and Rodney's is at Rodney Hooper 13. Reg is not active on Twitter, uh, but he is very active. And Canaccord has been, I think, among the biggest players going back to, you know, I don't know, Ora Cobre days, uh, you know, over 10 years ago as having the greatest amount of coverage. I think your team, uh, covers some 35 stocks. We've had your colleague, Katie LaChapelle in Toronto uh, on the channel uh, in various forms, uh, but you've also been among the biggest financiers uh, you know, in, in, in most every you know, major deal. And in, in particular on the junior side, you cover it, I think, better than anybody. So those following Lithium in Australia and elsewhere certainly know about Canaccord, uh, but you also we want to talk about when we actually want to start with this is uh, a mutual good friend of ours, Tazo Arima, who was the founder of Piedmont Lithium a number of years ago, a uh, visionary uh, in lithium then, is also a visionary in titanium, a company called Iperian X, which uh, Rodney and I have had some association with and own some equity interest in as well. Uh, you just initiated with a 40 page note or so. Uh, so let's start with that and Roddy may have some questions, um, you know, about, about Iperion. Then we'll go into your note from a, a macro perspective. And most importantly, we're going to focus on the companies on the ASX that you cover that have more than hundred percent upside, uh, according to your revised target prices. So with that, welcome Reg. Thanks Sal and thanks Ronnie. It's uh, good to uh, chat to you guys again. Um, look, our, our, our investment case for Iperion X is driven by what I would call an intersection between a commodity style or metal market style play and a manufacturing play. So Iperion X um, has exclusive rights to a, uh, a patent protected process uh, technology uh, called uh, Hammer for short, a hydrogen assisted met metallothermic reduction. Um, a lot of words, a lot of syllables, but basically what this process allows uh, Iperion to do is it allows them to take titanium metal scrap, uh, effectively recycle it, reprocess it, and produce a high purity uh, titanium metal powder. Now that powder can then be spherinized via Iperion X's uh, uh, granulation, um, sintering and deoxygenation technology um, into a spherical powder. That material can then be used in additive manufacturing, which is like 3D printing and things like that. Um, the other potential product route is you take this angular powder and, and you can put it through Iperion X's um, hydrogen sintering and phase transformation process technology, which allows you to produce a wrought-like metal product, be it a bar or a rod or a billet or something like that. 
that has the same metal properties as virgin metal. Now, um, why all that's important is because the existing um, titanium metal production route is very long. It's very complex. It's a fragmented supply chain. Um, the, it's very energy intensive, which means it's very expensive. Now, titanium metal itself is one of the best metals out there. Um, it's got very high strength to weight. Um, it's anti-corrosion properties. It's biocompatible. But the reason we don't use it for more things than what we do as a society is because it's hideously expensive, which in turn is due to the fact that this crawl process, which is a conventional method of producing the metal, is, is so um, energy intensive and long. So what Hyperion X's uh, process allows you to do, it allows you to shorten um, the, the, I guess the, the production time and the lead time to produce a metal. But not only that, you're not using virgin um, feedstock material uh, like you would the crawl process where you require ilmenite and rutile, you have to chlorinate it. You then put it through multiple rounds of uh, energy intensive vacuum arc smelting. Um, whereas this process allows you to take the, the metal waste um, from machining of other titanium metal products uh, and you're effectively recycling it. So it's super interesting. Now, that's the manufacturing side of the, um, our investment case for the company. The other side is the, is the macro. Um, and I kind of liken this to uh, the investment thesis for rare earths, whereby uh, the Chinese, we all know, control 92, 93% of global rare earth refining capacity. But yet the West, um, uh, you know, re permanent rare earth magnets are hideously important to auto and, and renewable energy and so on and so forth. Um, but the difference with rare earths with what I see in titanium is that most of the world's magnet manufacturing is also in China. Now in titanium, um, between China and Russia, they produce 70% of the world's sponge feedstock. Now sponge is the precursor material before you are able to produce a refined uh, titanium metal product. Um, and during COVID, the United States closed down all of their sponge manufacturing capacity. Now. The US is, uh, consumes about 30% of the world's titanium metal in some very strategic and important industries such as aerospace, defense, automotive, consumer electronics. Uh, but uh, the country is 100% reliant upon import of sponge feedstock. Now, given the importance of defense and given the importance of the aerospace industry to the United States, that highlights a, a very fragile supply chain. Um, and we see an opportunity for Hyperion X once they're able to prove this process at commercial scale and ramp up uh, to be able to reshore titanium metal production, but not only that, be able to produce that metal at a much lower cost. But not only that, you can actually produce a product in any shape or form by virtue of uh, their, their process technologies, thereby increasing your yield, reducing your waste, um, lowering your buy-to-fly ratios and things like that. So all up and in summary I, I find this one of the most interesting companies I've, I've come across for some time um it, it's almost that it sits at the intersection of as i said you know a manufacturing business and um you know a very a, a appealing and attractive uh geopolitical driven you know commodity slash metal market play and that's you know it brings me to a question reg is if you think about that does this potentially make titanium and what our period x doing more of a strategic or critical mineral for the U.S. than even say something like lithium. Yes, I, I would say so. Yet um, the International Center for Strategic Studies last year estimated that uh, global defense spending increased by ten percent year on year to two point three trillion. We currently have three global conflicts. We've got rising geopolitical and trade tensions all over the place, um, and there is. I wouldn't call it saber rattling, but certainly increased tension, which is driving this increased defense spending. Now, the defense industry uh, or sector is one of the, the United States' largest industries, um, but it's also very important uh, strategically for them. So given that titanium is used in um, uh, weaponry, it's used in uh, the army for armory, it's used in the Navy, um, it's used in uh, Air Force, that in, in itself makes it highly strategic. Now, if we're getting away from uh, military applications, it's use in aerospace uh, in, for, for a company like Boeing, for example, is also very important. Um, the amount of titanium used in wide body passenger aircrafts has increased uh, 50% uh, in the last couple of decades. And today, um, a brand new Boeing 737 is about 15% by unladen weight uh, titanium. 
Now, the reason for that is we're trying to reduce our emissions. We're trying to uh, improve the fuel efficiency of these aircraft. So all the next generation aircraft that the big uh, global aerospace companies are looking at, at manufacturing and producing um, want to improve their carbon footprint, improve their fuel efficiency, and lightweighting your aircraft is one of the best ways to do it. Now, it's for those two reasons that I think um, titanium, yeah, could very much be more strategic to the US today um, than, say, lithium uh, or rare earths, for example. Reg, uh, I forgot to mention, uh, Iperian X now has about a 500 million uh, market cap. The stock has risen, you know, aggressively. Uh, what has caused this rise and, uh, you know, in recent months and, and what is their path to, uh, I think there's, they're, they're going to have near-term revenue, you know, this year and, and, and scale up from there to, to justify, you know, your valuation, which, uh, you know, is, is still, you know, more than a hundred percent or nearly a hundred percent upside to where it is today, which would make it like a 750, 800 million market cap. So what underpins all of that? I'd probably highlight how that our valuation is heavily risked as well. Um, given that, uh, I guess the company is yet to move from pilot scale to commercial scale production, and that will happen over the next couple of years, as you say. Uh, they are currently constructing a 125 ton per annum demonstration scale facility uh, in Virginia in the United States. Uh, we expect them to follow that uh, with a scale up of the process tech towards something in the realm of 2000 tons per annum of titanium metal powders. So, yeah, over the next couple of years, uh, we are forecasting them to move to yeah, that commercial scale production. But what underpins our valuation of this is um, one of the competitive advantages the company has is they can produce a product, a titanium metal product for much cheaper than conventional methods, but they can also produce exactly what a customer needs. Now, what that also means is what they're producing is not a commoditized product. So there's, we've made some assumptions about um, how much of the, their production is, uh, goes into additive manufacturing, for example, in uh, things like 3D printing, or how much goes into larger format products where they produce like a near net shape, uh, like a rod, a bar or a billet, or an ultra near net shape uh, where that material can be wrought or, 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 um, or, or sintered or, or uh, manufactured into something that's uh, far more usable without the waste of uh, existing process routes, which include machining and things like that. So we've made some assumptions around that, but on our numbers um, and given uh, our estimates of the size of the US titanium market, we think that these guys could capture minimum uh, four, five, 10% of the US titanium metal market um, on our current base case estimates with our pricing assumptions and based on the cost estimates that these guys have released in a, let's call it a feasibility study uh, from 2023, you know, we think the, the business is capable of, of, of $300 million a year in EBITDA. So relative to the current market cap, that actually looks pretty attractive, especially when you consider a Howmet, for example, which is a very large established uh, US listed titanium metal producer um, that trades on 17 times uh, EBITDA and has a $26 billion market cap. So the, the market opportunity for Iperion X is very, very large um, uh, in that it only ever has to focus on the United States um, and that should underpin a, a very substantial business um, once they uh, de-risk the business through scaling up of their production process. Okay. Th thank you very much. We're going to be interviewing Tazo, I think, next week. So this was just a precursor to that. We just wanted to... Uh take the opportunity. So uh, all you lithium fans of uh, Rockstock Channel, it is Rockstock Channel, it's not a lithium stock channel, although it's 90% uh, or so lithium. But uh, given the vision of Tazo Arima, uh, first in coal, I met him, you know, at the age of 28. Uh, and then we worked with Piedmont, you know, from seed funding round in 2016. Uh, and I was talking with Reg, you know, back then as an early backer of Piedmont. And we're going to talk about Piedmont shortly along with uh, seven or eight other companies that have more than 100% upside. Uh, but first, uh, Reg, why don't we start uh, walking through your first half, you know, recharge note on, on March 8th. Um, why are you calling the bottom now? You know, when I approached you in December to do this, you know, video, you said you wanted to wait. <laughs> the idea, I didn't think we were at the bottom yet, and uh, uh, it turns out I was probably right on that front. Look, uh, as, as you said, you know, we, we think pricing's bottomed now, um, and there's a number of reasons for that, and there's a number of reasons why we have more confidence in that. Uh, and these are all basic mineral economics 101 concepts, right? So the, the first one is um, pricing's in the cost curves. Um, you know, in our research, uh, we put our own cost curves together. Uh, we have a very comprehensive uh, supply-demand model. 
Um, that forms the basis for that. Uh, but when chemical pricing in China bottomed out at somewhere around thirteen thousand dollars a ton for carbonate uh, in January this year, I don't think it was a coincidence that you started to hear reports that Chinese lapidolite uh, operations in China were starting to close or su for suffering from margin compression. So you know that's a classic bottom of the cycle signal. Um, you know, interaction with the cost curves, because um, typically that leads to uh, capacity curtailments um, and tightening up of the market. Secondly, uh, for Western companies, um, we have seen reports of a number of projects being deferred. Um, one mine in particular uh, in Northern Territory in Australia being closed. Um, ramp ups from new expansions and new projects being uh, slowed down. Um, again, these are very uh, classic bottom of the cycle signals, and you know exactly the same signals that we saw uh, in in 2020 uh, and 2019 uh, when when the market bottomed through that cycle. Next, um, at thirteen thousand dollars a ton, and you know, well, I think spodumene, depending upon what price reporting agency you look at, you know, bottomed at about nine hundred dollars for spodumene. Um, but we don't feel that, or well, we don't agree that that is anywhere near a level high enough to incentivize new supplies. But even though today, you know, the market you would describe as probably being more in balance, um, that's not the case based on our forecasts. Uh, by the end of the decade, we still expect very large deficits now, and we still need new supply to come into the market. But given that capital intensities for lithium projects have risen by minimum 50% in the last five years, that in itself means that you need a higher lithium price to give you a minimum return on your investment. So on our estimates, to give you a 20% IRR, you need a minimum $20,000 a tonne for chemicals or $1,400 a tonne for spodumene. And that forms the basis of our long-term uh, pricing expectations. Um, the last part, uh, the last thing I'd, I'd like to mention is that um, it's been very interesting speaking to a lot of investors and uh, I've been quite uh, taken aback by the negative narrative on lithium demand. Um, interestingly, it seems to be more prevalent with North American investors that I speak to, and I get where it's coming from. You know, you've got the likes of Ford and General Motors last year having said, um, you know, we're not just not seeing demand for our product, we're going to push our investment plans out. Um, you also had softer economic conditions in China, which some might argue were, were weighing on the demand outlook. But the reality is 2023 um, was a very strong demand year. Um, you know, there were almost 14 million electric vehicles sold around the world. That was, you know, plus 30% year on year. Um, you also had uh, better than expected growth in, in other markets like uh, stationary storage, um, which last year is estimated to have reached 130 gigawatt hours of deployed battery capacity. And if you run through the mass, that's roughly 130,000 tons of LCE. So now if we have a look at what's happened so far in 2024, you know, we've seen January EV sales numbers, you know, 1.1 million units globally. That's very strong. That's 30% year on year. Um, February will be softer. Um, because of China's New Year holidays. Uh, but we have seen some reports from a, uh, a EV conference in China that so far in March to date, there's been 700 or 600,000 uh, EV sold, sorry, 350,000 EV sold in China alone in, in the first half of March. Um, so when not subscribers to this negative demand growth, and I think where a lot of this comes from is that if you listen to the rhetoric from the Western OEMs, they're not seeing the demand for their product because they're priced wrong. Their product is priced wrong. Their vehicles are too expensive for the general customer. Whereas if you have a look at China, um, BYD is eating even Tesla's lunch. And um, if you have a look at uh, Chinese auto exports uh, have risen by 30% year on year, 30% of which last year was electric vehicles. So just because um, we're not seeing that S curve shaped demand growth in Western markets like Europe and North America, doesn't mean that demand is not there. Noting still that today, 80% of global battery production is still in China. In our view, uh, lithium is still very much a China story, or it very much will be in 2024 and 2025. It's not till the, I guess, the latter part of this decade that we expect um, EV penetration to increase in established uh, markets like North America and Europe, and, and that's going to give the demand a little bit of a kick. So we're not worried about you know, slower US EV sales. Um, to us, it's all about China. Uh, and, and for all the uh, data that we've seen, that remains very, very strong. Jumping in here from the editing room to tell you about Lithium Royalty Corp. Lithium Royalty Corp is at the center of a global energy transition and manages a globally diversified portfolio of lithium-focused royalties in electrification and decarbonization. 
with 32 royalties on 29 higher grade, lower cost projects from exploration to production, LIRC covers all the bases with well-managed risk, ESG considerations, and a scalable royalty structure. Lithium Royalty Corp is traded on the Toronto Stock Exchange ticker symbol LIRC. To find out more, visit lithiumroyaltycorp.com. So I, I, I guess, Red, Red, we're on the same map on this. The only thing that makes it trickier that it's gone back to inverted commas China-centric recently with, you know, it's almost a reaction to the IRA and to European initiatives and so on is having a decent look through as to how real the threat is of material from Africa, new material and China lipidolite. So the question is, is this a smokes and mirrors thing or can you really up a 0.3 or 0.35% grade lipidolite operation produce and, and grow production in a, in a 12, 13, $14,000 a ton environment? We think the answer to that is no. Uh, we think the answer to that is no. And, and that's something that we address to a degree in, in our recent research. Um, you know, our estimates for a low grade lipidolite, uh, suggest that the costs for chemical production from that source, um, you know, are well above $15,000 a ton. And even for your high grade lipidolites, whose grade might be 0.5% Li2O, you know, once you take all that the way through to uh, chemicals, you know, something closer to 13. And, and that's backed up by the fact that it's, uh, again, I, I don't think it's a coincidence that when pricing hit that point, that you started to hear reports of these lipidolite operations being shut. But I think the more interesting part of the supply side is what's going on in Zimbabwe. Um, we were all aware of these projects. We were all aware of these deposits, but I think what might've surprised the market was the speed and the scale at which they came to market. Now you guys have been around, uh, resources for a long time and you'll, I'm sure, you know, you appreciate along with all your listeners is, is that when you rush things, you will typically stuff things up. Um, and, uh, I guess the risk for that supply out of Zimbabwe is that um, these projects were not designed and built to the same standards you might see done in Western Australia, for example. And so your recoveries are going to be low, um, your yields are going to be low, but perhaps more relevant for the cost curve is that can these Chinese groups who all three of them for those three big mines own their own conversion facilities in China, are they able to transfer price that concentrate out of Zimbabwe, thereby avoiding uh, local income taxes and royalties? Um, if they can do that, then their costs of production on a chemical basis or an LCE basis are quite low, you know, $8,000, $9,000 a ton. If they can't do that, they have to export at arm's length at market prices. And given the transport differential from Zimbabwe in a landlocked country to a port, whether it's in Mozambique or South Africa, um, all the way to China, um, you know, we, we think that land at that material would have to cost somewhere you know, close to $1,000 a ton for spodromate. So when you work through the maths on that, that would equate to roughly a thirteen or fourteen thousand dollar a ton cost to produce chemicals. So um, the, I think the real question that we've been asking ourselves, Rodney, is that what price do we need to see that re-incentivizes uh, uh, you know low quality or low grade production back into the market? You know whether it's Chinese lipidolite or Zimbabwean spodumene. Um, given how volatile pricing has been. Uh, we think you would need a much higher price, uh, for a much longer period of time, even than compared to the rally that we've seen in the last few weeks. So that's why we're confident that, that we think pricing has plenty of room to move higher from here and that there's a, a large chunk of supply in the market that's at considerable risk. You know, our own supply demand forecasts are relatively conservative because we assume that, you know, half the world's, uh, lipidolite is still online. Uh, in our modeling. And we assume that all these Zimbabwean operations ramp up to full capacity over the course of the next two years. Um, now, given that those two sources of supply together comprise, I don't know, 350, 400,000 tons a year of LCA capacity, um, you take even a fraction of that off. And then on our estimates, all of a sudden, you're not looking at a surplus year, you're looking at a deficit year. So um, that's, yeah, hopefully that answers your question. I listened to the Goldman Sachs call uh, two weeks ago, and they were saying Zimbabwe is $800. You're saying it's $1,000. They didn't mention anything about this integration thing. And if I'm Zimbabwe, you know, I, I want to keep the money and get the taxes in Zimbabwe. This is a government that said to all the players in lithium, you can't export DSO. 
um, in the meanwhile, we'll let you export concentrate, but ultimately we want you to build downstream facilities here. So to then turn around and say, you know what, um, we're going to transfer price all the profits uh, into China. I, I don't think that would go down very well with, with those, the Zimbabwean government. Um, but that's certainly something that we're watching closely and, and, and doing some work on to understand better because it is a, a very large part of the supply side equation. And it's a very large part that we think um, a, a, a proportion of which would be at risk uh, under the current pricing environment. Yeah, the, 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 the Zimbabwe statistics late last year, this is what caught most of us, you know, in the market by surprise, apart from the China lapidolite, was just how fast uh, that came. There, there's the Bakita mine, there's the Sabi Star mine, and then there's the Arcadia mine. We've heard the Arcadia mine under YU Cobalt is not looking so great in terms of what you said, Rush. There was an article, you know, late last year about, um, you know, labor issues and the like. But the other two, like Chinese mines, um, you know, they've been pretty good in general. Yes, you know, if you rush things, like core was rushed and that was a problem, um, you know, so it's not only the the um, the Chinese that might rush, rush things, but we really appreciate you uh, squeezing in the time here and we know we're rushed. So that's why we're going to speed through some things here, uh, Reg. So if you were not a skeptical, uh, you know, North American investor and you've been looking at lithium over the years, but you never really invested and you're finally like kind of like doing some homework and saying, okay, I've missed the, the previous rallies. I know it's cyclical. We're at a bottom. I, I've, I have no money to, I haven't allocated any money yet. Okay. But I want to put, you know, $500 million to work, you know, across 10 stocks. What should I do, Reg? What we're saying to our clients at the moment, Howard, is that uh, this is a different market than what we saw last cycle. Um, what's different now is the supply side does appear to be much better stacked. Now, let's ignore for the minute that every new lithium project that's ever come to market has been late by an average of, say, two years. Let's just ignore that for the minute. But the supply side does appear to be much better placed, um, at least for the rest of this decade, through a combination of projects that have already gone through feasibility and some of which are in construction, but also um, new discoveries and the ability for incumbent producers to uh, expand existing operations at a much lower capital intensity than a Greenfield project. Now, with that in mind, um, the days of, you know, the heady days of 2022, where we saw, you know, $6,000 a ton spodumene prices are probably well behind us. And I don't think you're going to see those again. So we're probably looking at a much more uh, subdued pricing environment, which I think the industry, the EV industry will benefit from because lower prices mean lower cost batteries in theory, which would mean lower cost electric vehicles. Um, but with respect to the equities, um, we would like to see some more, I don't know, signals that the market is stronger before, you know, we start moving uh, wholesale or, or, or I would suggest you move wholesale into the smaller end of the market. I think at this juncture, given how oversold a lot of equities were, you, you know, the, the, the lower risk uh, investment would be into an established lithium producer um, who would benefit from margin expansion as pricing rises or, or rallies through the course of this year. Now, if things are a little bit better than what we thought and prices move a little bit higher, that gives us a little bit more confidence that um, capital would start to move down market cap and then you would start to see a return of, of positive momentum and sentiment towards your earlier stage names. But Red, Red, Red so, sorry, I'm going to like, let me just um, interrupt a second. Let's say it's not 500 million, it's like $100 million. And let's say I have uh, a two to three year view. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to wait for the Pilbara's to run because all the things that were like at, you know, deeply discounted valuations in January, you know, like Wildcat was up 80% last month. So I don't want to miss that move. So I'm, I'm okay to take the risk. I'm just theoretically like, 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 um, with a two year view, right. Cause we, I, we can't time it. So you have, I, I I'm going to, we're going to flash up on the screen here. 10 junior names, Galan, Cygnus, Green Technology Metals, Latin Resources, Piedmont Lithium, Global Lithium, Patriot Battery Metals, Delta Lithium, Ioneer, Winsome Resources. All of those are ASX listed, hard rocks in various jurisdictions, but they all have between 100 and 477% upside. And forgive me, all hard rock except one, which is Galan, and Galan has the most upside you know, in your view, and these range in market cap from 15 million Cygnus, you know, you're suggesting 
has, you know, nearly five times upside to 85 million. Like, why do you like that? Why do you like winsome? You know, why do you like Latin? You know, if you could just talk through some of those names uh, quickly, because it's in your note, you know, a paragraph about each, what you like about them. But I think we want to focus on the ones that have the most to your target price here. Uh, if you could go through, you know, some of those. Yeah. Uh, um, so the the discount to valuations that some of these smaller uh, companies are trading on is the inverse of why we would not say to an investor today, you know what, um, Pilbara is a, a great company to invest in if you want exposure to the lithium market. Um, these things uh, are often uh, sold down the most um, uh, because they're much earlier stage in those companies. So that's, so that's pretty obvious, but uh, there's some quite varied um, names in there. And look, we are long-term bulls on the lithium sector. Uh, we have a favorable outlook long-term. And so as long-term investments, they would all uh, meet our criteria and, and hence our uh, valuations and target prices. But I, I guess on, on a shorter term view, um, some of that thesis would change a little bit depending upon you know, what that company was doing and where they were operating. So for example, let's say uh, Spodumene never saw $1,500 again, and we were looking at $1,300 flat forever. That really would change the way we would think about um, which projects would be developed and when. So um, under a more a muted pricing environment, you would be looking for projects with low capex low OPEX, and that would point me to a project like Sigma. Oh, sorry, um, Sigma would be one of them, but, but Latin resources for, for, for another one. They will have a um, feasibility study out uh, in the middle of the year. Um, Brazil is a renowned low-cost operating environment, and you could do what you can do in Brazil for a fraction of the, the, the cost of what you would do in Australia. So that one would tick that box. If we saw pricing um, shoot up a lot higher uh, than our forecasts or you know get it towards that $2,000 a tonne, we think that would lead to improved sentiment towards expiration again, because ultimately, you know, we forecast out to 2030 in that research, but you know, that doesn't mean that the, um, that the, uh, the growth in electrification and transport stops at that point, and we will still need more projects developed and d discovered as we move into the 2030s. Um, so that's when I would look at things like a Cygnus, for example, who are drilling, um, a very, uh, prospective, uh, prospect in, in Quebec, um, called Eau Claire. Um, uh, Winsome Resources uh, is, is another one that we really like. You know, they've done a great job of making a major discovery at Adena um, just down the road from Patriot. Um, they are yet to complete feasibility studies and move you know, further down the path towards development and production. So I think you know, to answer your question um, <laughs> in the easiest way possible, a, a lot of the kind of things that we would recommend to our investors, um, and I know this might be a, a little bit of sitting on the fence a little bit, but the price action of the underlying commodity will dictate capital flows. And when you get buying pressure on stocks, um, that in itself is determined by, um, you know, the, the underlying price. So, uh, right now we're a little bit, a little bit more cautious, um, certainly more optimistic than most others. Um, and that sees us recommend perhaps lower risk names, but certainly over the medium to longer term, you know, all those particular companies offer do, do offer some very significant valuation upside based on the way that we valued them. Um, and, and, uh, long-term expectations on pricing. Okay. That's helpful, uh, on a few of them. There's a number of people who, uh, you know, are looking for more supply cuts potentially. And, and I think in your research, um, maybe it came out a little bit, uh, before, uh, Mount Catlin at Arcadium, um, you know, also had a scale back from that, which is relatively meaningful, but they're, they're still going to produce, but you basically said. It, we do, we just interviewed Paul Graves. He said, if, um, your prices need to be like 1500 to have two to three year mine life left at Mount Catlin, if prices were a thousand, it probably would be shut down next year. Hopefully they're not going to be a thousand, you know, again, the last print at Pilbara was 1200, but uh, a lot of people are, are watching, you know, the North American lithium mine in, uh, Quebec as the only spodumene mine, you know, operating in North America. Uh, but w what's your sense on, uh, whether or not that, um, survives because obviously both, uh, Siona and Piedmont stocks have taken substantial hits on a fear that, you know, they each have a hundred million dollars in the bank or so, but, um, you know, what's your assessment of how they're doing kind of ramp up wise, right? And they obviously have different economics in that mine, but what's the probability that this mine survives? 
uh, or, 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 you know, doesn't shut down in your opinion. Look, both the joint venture partners there have said to the market that they're undertaking an operational review at the asset um, in response to low pricing. Now that operational review is being undertaken not because the the ramp up was uh, missing expectations. And if you go back and have a look at say owners December quarter report, production of concentrate in the the month of December was you know, close to fifteen thousand tons. That's a very strong performance. So if they can if they can continue at that rate um, and annualise, you know that puts them I don't know what it is one hundred eighty one hundred seventy thousand tons per annum roughly. You know that's well on its way to design rates for the project. And if you can increase your production your fixed costs um, on a unit basis go down. So if they can successfully ramp up, their cash costs of production can go down. And if we continue to get some momentum on pricing, um, then that opens up um, an operating margin and, and free cash flow. So to answer your question, I don't think the project gets shut down, even if we didn't see higher pricing, and uh, but they were still able to deliver the ramp up of the project. Um, it's perhaps better that you operate at a break even or even lose a little bit of money every quarter as opposed to closing the thing down, especially if you've got a balance sheet. Now, Sayona has a balance sheet. They've got $150, uh, $150 million in cash as at the end of December. So unlike a, a single mine uh, company that um, doesn't have a lot of liquidity available to it, um, these guys have a, a what I would call a, a reasonable buffer, um, noting also that they don't have any debt. Um, and if things did get tough, uh, Sayona, for example, has another asset called Mobiland, which could be divested in, in order to keep things going. So um, my personal view is I, I don't think it, it gets closed, um, especially in light of what's happened with pricing in, in, the, in recent weeks, um, and that um, there is uh, the, the potential for them to you know, thread the needle and get through this cycle low, especially if they can continue the performance of the ramp up that they showed uh, towards the end of the last quarter. Okay, great. And I think uh, the Sion is a 75-25 joint venture. So for every uh, $3 Sion has to pay, I think Piedmont pays $1, you know, on the on the CapEx. So, and Piedmont has like $100 million in the bank as well. So from a dilution risk point of view, both companies have other assets. Piedmont obviously sold some Sion shares, uh, but that's good to hear. You don't think that that's going to shut down. So it, it, the recovery rates are much higher than they were at core. They, like, Core had very substantially different issues, right? That was rushed. North American Lithium, you know, third time's a charm. I think they put a lot of effort into the planning, you know, of that. And it's only really been six months since they ramped, you know, started ramping it up. And it, it is now under the helm of James Brown, who has built a successful mine in Altura before. So anyway, that, that's my view that that should be okay. Galan has very high upside here as well. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, there were some people just, uh, I want to acknowledge, um, we asked a question of uh, Paul Graves. I don't know if you saw our interview with Paul Graves, but a few uh, Galan shareholders were unhappy about his lithium chloride comment. We haven't had an opportunity to respond to that. Do you have a view on that? Reg, uh, I think I think Galan, uh, uh, well, the, specifically the lithium chloride. Uh, I think there was a mention of some permitting issues there as well, and, and Galan uh, responded to that uh, in in their own way. But but um, look, I, I like Galan. I, I like the path of lower technical risk brine production. Having covered Ora Cobre, which became all chem for ten years, um, I know what that journey is like, and it's not a, an easy project to build. So if you can still benefit from being a brine producer. And when I say benefit, that means you're at the bottom end of the cost curve without all the technical risk and capital and long lead times and ramp up uh, that you would have with a full, fully integrated carbonate plant, then why wouldn't you take it? And so um, I, I, I like what Galan's doing. I like the approach it's taken. You know, one of the advantages they, uh, aside from the lower technical risk and the lower capex is um, there's potentially a ready-made market for uh, their chloride in Argentina. Um, if you fast forward you know, another five or six, seven years, there's going to be a dozen carbonate plants in Argentina. And having gone through the experience with Oracobre, not all of them are going to be successful during commissioning and ramp up for various reasons. Um, so there's the opportunity to sell your chloride to other carbonate producers in, in Argentina. But then also SQM has been exporting chloride to China for a long time. Um, so there's a, a, you know, global market opportunities for chloride as well, not to mention in the longer term, if we do see the development um, of the uh, lithium metal market, chloride is the precursor material for lithium metal. So look, I, I, I like what Galana are, are doing and um, look forward to um, 
those guys are delivering on the build. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I guess the key benefit for a company like that with a project like that is, is where they would otherwise sit on the cost curve. That project, um, you know, Brian-based assets can survive under most pricing scenarios that most people could come up with. Um, normally the offset to that is high capex and high technical risk. And if, but if you can address that through, you know, the production, at least initially of an intermediate product, then, um, I, I think that's, um, I think that's a great way to, to, to go. Your target valuation of 870 million is, uh, about what, uh, Rio Tinto paid for, uh, a more challenged asset in Rincon. Rincon uh, yeah. So, so we'll, we'll see about that. I'm conscious of your time. I have so many more questions like album all, um, uh, auction. You know, could you comment on that? Yeah. Um, so we all saw the Pilbara result. Um, I guess, uh, yeah, to some that may have been disappointing, but to me, that was a great signal. Um, I, for me, it's less about the price at which these guys can sell that material for. Um, I, in my view, something has changed structurally in China, whereby you've got two of the world's largest lithium producers all of a sudden, um, looking to auction off material. And I think it's more than just price discovery. Noting also that Albemarle has never actually ever sold quadrumene concentrate before. All their production from green bushes has either been toll treated or gone into their own converted plants. So this is a very interesting development in the market. And not only that, they're doing it with their own version of the BMX, which is the Pilbara Online uh, auction platform. So look, I, I think if they were to sell that material, um, you know, with the spodromene price of anywhere from you know, 1200 to 1300, I think that's a great outcome and a great signal for the market. It, it would be suggestive to me um, of a continuation of the restocking of the supply chain after the destocking that we saw last year um, in advance of expectations of continued demand growth. So yeah, um, I, 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 I can't see that uh, auction um, um, in any way, shape or form being considered a negative and they're subject to price. You know, I think it could be a, a, a bit of a catalyst for the sector. Okay. And uh, I don't see you covering MinRes here, but a number of companies you do cover like Delta Lithium, Global Lithium, uh, Wildcat uh, have stakes uh, or uh, mineral resources own stakes in them. What do you make of uh, MinRes's land banking and this uh, recent announcement uh, you know, on this Kalguli you know, processing idea? I think it's more than land banking. I, I think it's, it's using their uh, their skills, their expertise, their scale, their, their balance sheet, um, to take advantage of, uh, their existing infrastructure and their existing mining services business and, and building up over the longer term, a very substantial Western Australian you know, concentrate business. Um, I think they've shown through their, their operation at Mount Marion and then more recently at, at, at Wajina that they are, that are good operators, but I, I think what they're doing with that purchase of the Poseidon nickel plant. Um, their investments in in other particular assets um, is a reflection of of uh, where they think the industry can go, um, but also how they can do things differently and perhaps better than some others might be able to, given uh, given their scale and given their mining services credentials. So, um, again, you know, I've always been of the view that the lithium sector is probably too fragmented, and in order for supply to ever meet demand. Um, it needs to be run, developed, built, financed by larger, um, more experienced, capable and better capitalized companies. And so perhaps what you've seen in Western Australia is maybe the beginning of that at least, um, where you've got a smaller number of, of better capitalized groups that are better placed to be able to deliver these projects and deliver the supply that the market needs over the longer term. And uh, what do you make of the GFX, the, the Guangzhou futures? It seems to me that Australian stocks are very correlated to what the GFX futures are doing. Not so much kind of U S stocks or Canadian stocks, but it very much seems like someone has like a basket trading algorithm tied to this is just me speculating, you know, the Guangzhou futures, it goes up in the middle of the day. And then all of a sudden like 10 stocks go down, you know, exactly with that. Do you feel that that's happening? And, or is that like a leading indicator or. CATL, yeah, maybe, maybe. the other battery company is like, well, what, what are the leading indicators that we should be looking for? I, I think what equity in, or speculators and equity investors want to see is, is a live price. And we, we know that lithium is not traded on a terminal exchange anywhere um, in its, uh, you know, in its non-derivative form, right? And um, so this isn't like a London metal exchange traded metal, um, but uh, equity investors want 
a manifestation of the market conditions to give them a guide as to how the market is tracking at any point in time. Now, um, the spot price doesn't necessarily move every day, um, uh, at least the one in China, and, and certainly contract prices are, are much more steady and stable in duration and over time. So I think what the, the, that futures market allows speculators to do is, is it gives them a, you know, a point in time picture of, of what the market uh, is essentially re reflecting. Um, now, do I think that that's a, an, an accurate reflection of what a market price uh, should be? Uh, maybe, maybe not. It's a very shallow market. Uh, there's not a lot of contracts traded on there. And you'll see that you know, cathode manufacturers aren't going to the Guangzhou Futures Exchange to somehow get exposure to material for their own businesses. Um, so to me, that, that makes it a little bit lacking. But what we've seen over time is that that futures market has been an indicator of the ultimate direction of the spot price. So I think it's becoming more relevant and more important to equity investors. And, and as you say, you know, the, the, the stocks are starting to trade um, you know, based on what those futures prices are doing. Um, yeah, I, it's, it's a little bit disconcerting, but at the same time, perhaps it's another step in the progression of the market and evolution of the lithium market towards something that's a little bit more mature, like what we saw in iron ore uh, through the early part of, you know, the 2000s in, into a move away from these long dated legacy uh, or fixed price contracts into something, you know, more akin to a, a liquid um, LME style, um, you know, market. So yeah, ongoing progression and evolution. Um, do I put a lot of weight to it? Not necessarily, but maybe a little bit more than I used to. Just one thing, Reg, um, to, to just finish off, uh, in your view, has your, again, you flagged CapEx increases, which is meaningful. And I think, you know, that has to be factored into returns. And we've also seen interest rates rise. So cost of doing anything has also gone up. Has your uh, long-term fair value pricing for lithium chemicals moved at all with the latest goings on, or are you still in the, uh, we were pretty similar in the sort of low twenties to mid twenties as a, a long-term incentive price to get enough material out there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Our long-term pricing is based on our assessment of uh, a minimum incentive price level. Um, but it's a little bit, uh, you know, hypothetical, you, you might say, because if we, if our forecasts are right and demand, uh, continues to grow and supply continues to arguably um, you know, disappoints uh, as it has in the past. Um, and the scale of the deficits and the scale of the demand growth might require a much higher incentive price to incentivize um, that scale of supply to come to market. So um, on one hand, you know, our long-term pricing, which yes, sits at about $22,000 a tonne for chemicals, might look relatively bullish uh, compared to where prices are today. Um, that may not be enough to incentivize another 2 million tons of supply that we might need by the end of the 2030s or, or 2035. So um, I think if we look back here and you and I have this conversation in, in another 10 years time, um, that long-term pricing assumption might, might come across as, as ultimately having been conservative. But as it stands today, that's what we assess as being the minimum required to give me a minimum 20% you know, IRR. Is 20% the right number? Given a greenfield operation for uh, you know a brand new company, uh, you I tell me, how you're you an investor. 30, 30, what would I, you I'd want? 30, 30, 35 percent. You know, if, if it's a venture capital, never been done before. Like I don't. If you're Minres, you know they have a twenty percent. You know IRR. We, we listened to Paul Graves. He said you know ten to twelve percent in a Western jurisdiction, twenty percent in Argentina. You know, but I'm more in uh, Chris Ellison's camp. You know, twenty percent but he's an established operator, right? You know, if you're doing a clay, if you're doing a, you know, DLE, much higher, you know, or even integrated hard rock, you know, in, in, in America, like conversion is very difficult. Capital intensities continue to move at the way that they're moving and growing at the rate that they're growing, then our incentive price would have to go higher. So we're just saying today, if I was developing a greenfield project, I need $22,000 a ton to give me 20%. Now, if I need 30%, then obviously that price has got to go up. Or if capital intensities continue to rise and that price has got to go up. Yeah, I, I think ultimately we will look back and we'll see um, those long-term pricing assumptions that we're talking about now as potentially being conservative. We will interview your colleague, Katie LaChapelle, I think, before we interview you again, so she could talk about That's right. Canadian listed names. No problem. Good to see you guys. We'll, um, okay. we'll chat soon. Thanks a lot, Thanks, Reg. Reg.